We need to make sure that there are people that want to go to space that are not NASA astronauts. We need space flight to be embedded in every part of the American culture because that's how we keep moving forward. That's how we encourage people and our members of Congress to continue investing in this activity. Um, but I'm also a big fan. Is it Mary Liz? Is that your name? That's right. I'm also a big fan of sending, of sending journalists. So maybe there's an opportunity I'm for really, you. Yeah. I'm small. I don't weigh very much. <laughs> <laughs> that was NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine at an outdoor press event with commercial crew astronauts. This took place just before the Boeing Starliner test flight. Yeah, I got the opportunity to ask a question and was so honored that everybody, all the astronauts and Jim Bridenstine wanted to jump in and answer the question. We'll hear that full discussion in just a bit. But first, this is a really special episode that we've been working on for a little while now, and there really doesn't seem to be a better time to release it than right now. Yeah, this this is a strange time, mm -hmm. you know, and it, it's so easy to lose sight of optimism and the excitement for the future when things are so confusing in the moment mm -hmm. and so much is in, in turmoil. But one of the best ways to work towards a better present or the most motivating way to work towards a better present is to look towards the future with optimism and, and excitement. Mm -hmm. So that, that's what we hope is woven through this special episode. The thing that gets me most excited about the future is considering human space exploration. And that's what we're going to talk about today. Almost a year ago, exactly today, we rushed into the NASA Press Auditorium. Yes, right after watching the SpaceX Crew Dragon demo launch. I will never forget that night. This was a major milestone in NASA's commercial crew program, which is putting human spaceflight in the hands of the commercial industry. NASA awarded contracts to both SpaceX and Boeing to send their astronauts to space. And while there were no humans inside this time, the mission sent the Crew Dragon capsule through all the motions of a typical human flight to the International Space Station, and the launch even felt different to us. Liftoff took place early in the morning. Liftoff was 2.49 a.m. Mm -hmm. And right afterwards, we rushed over to the press auditorium and took our seats. I was so tired, but running on pure adrenaline. Elon, you've spent 17 years pushing past adversity, doubt, and you must feel incredible to finally be at this stage. I'm just curious what advice you have to all the dreamers out there that are dealing with the same kind of doubt that you did? Oh, I always thought we would fail, so this is uh, all, it's all upside. You know, I thought maybe we had a 10% chance of reaching orbit starting out, so you know, people thought you know, when we started SpaceX, they said, oh, you're going to fail. Uh, so I agree. I think we probably will fail. Yeah. But it's worth trying anyway. Yeah. <laughs> How's that for honesty, huh? Yeah, they this, this, this said I'd lose all, lose all the money from PayPal. I was like, well, you're probably right. You know, and we almost did. We had first three launches of Falcon One didn't work, and the fourth one we scraped together some parts, and and that one worked. And if that one hadn't worked, it would, be, would have been that would have been it for us. I don't know. I really believe in the future of space, and and I think it's important that we become a space faring civilization and be out there among the stars. And I think that's one of the things that you know makes people excited about the future. And you know, we want the things that are in science fiction novels and movies not to be science fiction forever. We want them to be real one day. Science fiction to reality. That's what we're going to talk about today. So just a few minutes after I asked that question, our friend Ken Kramer asked Elon a very important and timely question. Ken Kramer, Space Up Close. Jim Bridenstine, you mentioned you want NASA to be one of many customers. So my question, Elon, where do you see Dragon going beyond NASA? Well, I think like the, the obvious thing would be private citizens that want to go to the space station, as has happened before. You know, it's been number of people that have gone to the space station on the Soyuz. And I think it would be pretty cool if people went to the space station on an American vehicle as well. So I think that's one of the things that we'll do. And obviously NASA is very supportive of that. And then, and then you know, maybe there's something beyond, uh, beyond the space station that we'll, we'll see. We're going to focus on the, getting this, this right for sure. That's the priority. 
Uh, but then after that, maybe something beyond, beyond Earth orbit. One year later, and this is becoming a reality. Just a month ago, we witnessed the SpaceX Crew Dragon in-flight abort test. This was the last big test before sending humans on this SpaceX capsule. As we speak, SpaceX is preparing for the next launch, which will take Bob Behnken and Doug Hurley, two of NASA's commercial crew astronauts, to the International Space Station, which is slated for early May of this year, 2020. Just after the in-flight abort test, we met Bob and Doug for an informal press briefing. So there were no microphones. There was no audio or video set up. This is just us in a little room asking questions, recording on our phones. Thank you for doing this. This is such an exciting moment for all of us. We are on the ground feeling the excitement from the public. Just wondering how you guys feel knowing that you're pioneering this new era of human space flight, going commercial, bringing it back to the U.S. What are your feelings around it? Yeah, it's it's certainly exciting, and you know, but space flight's like the biggest team sport there is. So we are just the lucky ones that get to fly the spaceship but there's so many people that have put years and years, you know, the commercial crew program at NASA, at SpaceX, at Boeing. You know, it, it's, a, it's a huge effort to get us to this point from eight and a half years ago since we flew shuttle last. So it's very humbling, certainly, and it's exciting. Uh, we also are trying to keep our focus on, you know, the technical matters, the operational matters, trying to get the vehicle ready to go so that when we fly it, everything goes the way it's supposed to. And then, you know, the. The critical part is certifying the vehicle for future crews, you know, the, the turtles that just graduated, you know, you know, making it a, a great vehicle for those guys. So it's, and, a, it's and a huge private citizen astronauts that will go too, right? Yeah. I, I mean, I think all those options are, are on the board. Um, certainly not on our flight, but at least we haven't been yeah. told we're yeah. flying with somebody else, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, but it is, it's, it's, it's a, yeah, it's a create great that opportunity. And I think that's the ultimate goal is to create that opportunity for, uh, more and more folks to have the opportunity that we've already had on space shuttles and uh, uh, hopefully Dragon, CST-100, and then more vehicles. I think the administrator said that earlier. You know, that's the ultimate goal is to increase that access opportunity. Let's pause on this for a moment. Okay. All right, I'm ready. For the first time since the last shuttle launch. 2011. That's right. Mm -hmm. For the first time since 2011, humans will be launching from Florida on a regular basis. It's back. It's coming back. It is so exciting yeah. to be here mm -hmm. right now. This is where we are. This is the reason we're here. <laughs> that's, that's right. That's why we're here. <laughs> now, with human spaceflight in the hands of the commercial industry, space tourism is about to take off. Mm -hmm. Space tourism is a real thing. Everything is changing mm -hmm. right now. You can feel it. Mm-hmm. To discuss some of the recent announcements in space tourism, I called my friend John Spencer, who is an expert on the subject. My name is John Spencer. I am an outer space architect. I am the founder and president of the Space Tourism Society. We were involved in almost everyone who's flown as a private space traveler. Uh, there have been seven people who have flown to space where they bought a ticket. It was all brokered through Space Adventures Corporation with the Russian space program. Now, no one has flown for 10 years. The last person to fly was the fellow from Circus Soleil in September of 2009. Uh, mm -hmm. That's when we finished the space station. As I mentioned, there's no room for another person because there's only two life boats, essentially, the Soyuz capsules with three seats each. We're now talking with Space Adventures, who's renewing all their activities. They recently just announced and got some good media attention that they've signed an agreement with uh, SpaceX to develop passenger flights using crew dragons to low Earth orbit. People would spend three or four days in Earth orbit. They would not go to a facility, but they would be orbiting Earth. Mm -hmm. So they hope to launch that business venture within the next two to three years. So that's a great teaming of having space adventures, which has the expertise and skill to negotiate and handle the logistics and the, the purchasing and the insurance and all those issues related to traveling to space as a private citizen, and SpaceX providing the vehicle, the rocket, and the vehicle and the capsule in order to do that. So just to reiterate that announcement, these private astronauts who purchase a ticket through Space Adventures 
will have the opportunity to fly higher than the space station. Mm. The first crew to do this will break all records for the highest orbit by a private citizen. Just days after my discussion with John, Space Adventures announced another agreement they signed with Roscosmos, the Russian space agency, and that will fly private citizen space travelers aboard the Soyuz capsule to the Russian segment of the ISS, and that's scheduled for 2021. Now, during all this, the website was was down. Yes, right, right, partly right my at the fault. Announcement. I kept hitting refresh, refresh, because I really wanted to know more about space adventures and this announcement. Mm -hmm. So after hitting the refresh button about 1,000 times, I finally found a statement on their website about why they've dedicated themselves to this mission. So I just want to read that that statement that we found. Humankind can only progress to become a spacefaring race by taking the small steps necessary to reduce the costs of access to space. I want to be a spacefaring race. Don't you? I do. I'm ready. Come let's, on. Let's go. What are we waiting for? <laughs> All right. So we're not the only ones. Thankfully, competition has already stepped into the ring. Axiom Space just joined in on the space tourism industry, announcing that they have an agreement to send an entirely private crew to space. This means there will be no NASA or Roscosmos astronauts or cosmonauts aboard. Instead, they'll have a crew entirely trained by Axiom. And this is just a small step toward their eventual goal of creating a privatized space station. So we now have these two companies, Space Adventures and Axiom Space, kind of like brokers or travel agents, right, that that create the relationship between the launch provider, SpaceX in this case, Mm -hmm. and private citizens that want to travel to space. They uh, take care of all the training, the insurance, the logistics, the scheduling, and they make this happen. Yeah, and in some cases, you can actually a la carte order Mm -hmm. different services. Like, you could just go through astronaut training if you want to. Right. But I don't know why you wouldn't want to (laughs) just save up and try to do the whole thing. (laughs) I'm sure it's it's a big difference in cost, but hey. Yeah, right, I get it. Right. So space tourism is about to take off big time, Mm -hmm. but it's not the first time that private citizens have flown to space. There's always pioneers in something, and they and anyone who flies in space truly, truly risks their life. It is dangerous. So they have to have a strong commitment. Our goal of the tourism industry is that thousands of people eventually get to go, and then tens of thousands of people get to go. So that that's why we're building the space tourism industry, but we honor and respect these first people who are private space travelers. Every single one of those pioneers to date have flown with space adventures. And we've met a few of them. I met Anusha Ansari about a year ago, and I love her story. She was born in Iran, a country that didn't even have a space program. But her dream of going to space was so strong since she was a child, and she worked really hard to create her own way to space, eventually launching to the ISS for several days before returning home. She did a lot of really cool science experiments on the space station, and I think she was the first astronaut to host a blog from Mm -hmm. space. Mm -hmm. Now she travels the world sharing her story, her transformative experience in space, which was very profound, and she inspires children around the world to follow their dreams. Richard Garriott was another pioneer in private space travel. He was determined to go despite being disqualified for vision. Mm -hmm. And we had an opportunity to meet him at South by Southwest last year. And we heard one of his talks that he gave as well. Folks here in may know me from my video gaming background and writing a series of games like Ultima. As these folks know, my my father was a NASA astronaut, went up on Skylab, and uh, uh, inspired me to want to go. But I was was told that I couldn't go uh, because I needed classes. And so I took the money that I earned in space, I earned in games, and invested it in commercial space. So I, I co-founded uh, something called the XPRIZE, we made a $10 million prize for the first private vehicle flying in space. Zero G Corp, we still fly the, the NASA parabolas and, and public parabolas. Uh, space Adventures, which is how I flew to space myself. In fact, they just announced two new clients, they're going up with the Russians. Uh, and I would argue that the XPRIZE the winning of the X-Prize was really the catalyst for this commercial era that we now live in. And what I'm very excited about is that the not only are we democratizing access in the way you just were alluding to, but also the cost of that access is coming down incredibly rapidly. You know, SpaceX 
uh, already commands something like 80% of the global launch market. Uh, and uh, of course, I'm also an investor in SpaceX. Uh, and uh, I think that trend will continue. It's only these people like Blue Origin and SpaceX and a few others now that are doing these reusable vehicles that are going to drive that cost down. And well, you know, when I flew, it was still the purview of you know, people willing to spend you know, incredible sums of money to go. Uh, it, we're, we're about to end the era where, you know, truly any of us can consider uh, flying payloads when you're in high school or college, uh, or flying yourself as a, an adult who's willing to save up for a few years. So it's, uh, I think we, we truly are living in a new golden age of space flight starting right now. So I think this is extremely important to note. These early pioneers of private space travel are wealthy people who were able to purchase their own tickets. But they did not stop at buying their own tickets. Nearly all of them had a transformative experience that made them passionate about providing a way for other citizens to have this experience as well. So beyond buying their tickets, most have poured more of their own money into the private space travel industry to ensure success. Several invested in the commercial space industry like Richard, funding the XPRIZE Foundation, Zero G Corp, Space for Humanity, and the list goes on. And this is how industries are built. Again, John Spencer. Using the airline as a model, you know, it was originally very expensive and very dangerous in the very beginning of the airline industry. Over time, as the technology evolved and people became more comfortable uh, with airplanes, more airplanes were built and more airports were built and more systems were put in place and eventually the cost came down dramatically and the safety went up. We see the same thing happening with uh, space industry, but faster actually. Nova Spivak was also one of those early pioneers. He actually flew to the edge of space with Space Adventures in 1999. This is before the official flights began in 2001. We also met up with him at that same event. Here's what he shared with us about his experience. Flying to the upper edge of the stratosphere in Russia in 1999 by bribing the Russian Air Force under the table, it was very sketchy. Um, so there was a huge amount of just terror. Um, and, you know, all of that, plus the fact that you're in a MiG-25 and you're you know, almost at 100,000 feet going Mach 3, um, it's, it was intense. I mean, really intense. A lot of things I didn't expect. Well, I remember talking to him about this and the the look of terror on his face as he was recounting this experience. But I was relieved to hear that he actually did have a moment of pause while he was up there staring at the earth from above. He told me that he fell absolutely in love with the planet and he confirmed that he had experienced the overview effect. This is a subject near and dear to our hearts. It's the reason we're doing the work we're doing. So anytime I talk to someone who's been to space, I ask if they experienced the overview effect. This is a term that was coined in the 1980s when space philosopher Frank White was pioneering the research of this perspective-shifting experience astronauts report when they view our planet from space. I was elated to discover that Frank White was the reason Nova went to space. After college, I read his book. I just happened to find the overview effect and I read it and it totally blew my mind. That is you know, a really important book uh, about how the astronauts, a lot of these were hardened Navy and Air Force guys, uh, had these major awakenings in space when they saw the earth from outside. And you know, these were guys that were not prone to philosophy or, or tearing up about anything. Um, but you know, they'd look out the window and they'd see the planet and literally it was like a religious experience for them. And it happened to pretty much all of them. And so Frank interviewed a lot of these folks and, and came up with this idea of what he called the overview effect, which is this hypothesis, I mean, I would say it's more than a, it's a theory, um, that when you see the system that you're in from the outside, you experience a kind of epiphany, which he calls the overview effect, where you suddenly understand the whole instead of just a bunch of parts. And in the case of you know the planet, understanding how it's a small, fragile, blue marble, 
uh, in the complete blackness of space is a, is a major experience, especially if you think of the, the historical and political context. Um, you know, they were in the Cold War. It was a time of extreme, um, you know, potential global nuclear war. Uh, and these guys, you know, both the Russians and the Americans all had this experience and it really brought them together too. And there was actually, even during the Cold War, that was one area where there was still cooperation with space. And so anyway, I read that book and I wrote him a letter and I said, you know, I think this is an amazing book. It blew my mind um, and I really want to get involved in space. And he wrote back and said, well, good news. Um, we're starting this thing called the, the International Space University um, and we're starting a space humanities department. And would you like to help us do that and then come and attend? It was a grad program. And so I did. And so I interned with them helped them form the humanities curriculum. And then I attended, I actually ended up studying space life sciences. And, and from there, I went to ISU and it was in Japan um, in 1992. And from there, I, I really connected with a lot of space people. And then in 1999, I flew to the edge of space in Russia um, with Peter Diamandis and Richard Garriott and, and these other folks on an early mission and then helped invest in a company called Space Adventures. We did zero gravity flight and still provide that. So I kind of got in through that side of things uh, and stayed interested. Nova flew to the edge of space with Space Adventures in 1999. And two years later, in 2001, Space Adventures sent their first private astronaut to space. The first person to pay to fly to space was a fellow named Dennis Tito, a successful businessman with a, a company that does uh, high-end brokering. Uh, and money management. However, his first job was working at JPL developing trajectories for Mercury missions. So he's always had a strong background in mathematics and statistics and eventually realized he could use that to develop formulas that had a high degree of predictability of stock valuations. So he became wealthy, kept starting his own companies. And in the 1999, people were talking about having their own uh, converting the Mir space station, Russian space station, into a tourist location. So Dennis was interested in that. That business didn't pan out, but some of the conversations from there led to the issues of space adventurers being able to negotiate a deal uh, between Dennis and the Russian space program for Dennis to fly. The way that worked is that the Soyuz vehicle, which goes to the space station with astronauts and some supplies, has three seats, but they would always fly with two seats with one of them empty. So by selling that seat to Dennis Tito, the Russians got millions of dollars and Dennis got to fulfill his life dream. Now, it wasn't easy for him to do that. NASA in the beginning was totally against having a private citizen fly to the space station. Uh, and they actively fought against that. They would not let Dennis train at the Johnson Space Center the way astronauts train. The Russians eventually told them, well, too bad, we're flying him. We were not, not going to lock him out, out of the space station. <laughs> so he flew and he, it was an excellent mission and it all worked out just fine. So today things are different. NASA is hugely supportive of private spaceflight. Yeah, at the recent Boeing Starliner press conference, I talked to NASA's administrator, Jim Bridenstine, as you heard, and NASA's commercial crew astronauts, Sonny Williams, Nicole Mann, Michael Fink, Chris Ferguson, and Josh Casada, about the excitement they have for sending private astronauts to space. Mm -hmm. As the administrator mentioned, this is really the new era of spaceflight. It's so incredible to be a part of that. And by this new era, what it's doing is it's opening up low Earth orbit. It's opening up space to not only just our government astronauts, but now commercial astronauts and more people on Earth that want access to space. We're talking about technology development. We're talking about science, but we're also talking about folks that can capture the amazement of space. So maybe teachers, maybe journalists, maybe artists that are able to gather everything that we see in space, the amazement of what we're doing, and they're able to translate that back to the people on Earth. And that's going to pay dividends and benefits, not only for inspiring the next generation, for helping us to understand as human race, as humankind, how we take care of our planet, 
how we interact with each other, and really where our future goes. So uh, I think it's the possibilities are, are just beginning, and it's incredible to be excited for that and for the launch tomorrow. That was astronaut Nicole Mann, who set up my question so perfectly. Hi, Mary Liz Bender with Cosmic Perspective, and this is a just direct follow-on to that. Back in the day, Frank Borman said we should have sent poets when he came back from space. And you mentioning artists going into space to translate this to us here on Earth uh, has me wondering, how are you all preparing for supporting those people that have a lot less training than you? And I've heard that training program for private citizen astronauts is about two months. Can you talk about what that looks like? So, uh, yeah, so I'd, I'd like to share this answer quickly with uh, Chris Ferguson, but I flew with two different private astronauts. Uh, they came up on uh, the Soyuz with us. If they're going to the International Space Station, uh, we have to train them on how to be safe aboard the International Space Station. It's a national asset, and space, even though we make it look cool and fun, it's a little bit dangerous up there, too. So we got to make sure that they're, they're going to be safe and uh, help keep the rest of the, the crew safe. So we're going to teach them the, the fundamentals of emergencies and things like that. You can almost think of it when when you get on an airplane, they tell you how to close your seat buckle and where the nearest exits are, uh, where it's going to be like that, but in space and, uh, and, and a lot more. Uh, then we're also going to help ensure that their mission is successful, whether it's a mission to to share their feelings and uh, poetry in space or whether they're up there to get a serious uh, material science experiment done. Uh, we're going to help ensure that they're successful. And we've done that, this in the past with uh, private space flight participants uh, flying up and down with Soyuzes. Now uh, there's going to be a lot more. And there's a uh, with uh, companies like Boeing, they're going to be able to offer the seats and uh, get things done. Chris, anything to add? That's Michael Fink, another of NASA's commercial crew astronauts, who just introduced his colleague, Chris Ferguson. So I, I think most of you know that um, the Starliner is built to hold up to seven. It's currently configured for five, and uh, we have uh, a, a deal with NASA for four of those seats. So clearly, we have uh, a lot of interest, and there have been um, a fair amount of uh, I think Colonel Cabana has signed up for at least one of those seats. I'm just hoping that on launch day he doesn't declare eminent domain and, and kick me out. But there are clearly opportunities that uh, I, I believe, as I had said earlier, when we build it, will they come? There will be plenty of opportunities for those. Now, uh, over time, safety will improve, costs will improve. And I really think that that is the long pole out there, is can we bring the cost of an orbital flight down to the realm at which perhaps um, – somebody that is of moderate means can do it. We probably are a few years away from that, but we won't get there until we start. Just real quick, I feel like I have to answer your question because uh, even though I was a physicist in my previous previous life, I think I'm the only one up here who went to a liberal arts college. So of course, uh, arts and sciences together have a special place in my heart. And I'll tell you, in my life as a high energy physicist, there was a quote that always resonated with me, both about science and especially about the arts. The director of the uh, Fermi National Accelerator Lab, where I used to work, uh, was in front of Congress testifying at the height of the Cold War. And he was asked how what we do would help protect the country. And he paused for a moment and he said, it's not going to help at all, but it's going to make it a country worth protecting. And so I'm, I'm right with you. I, I love the science and I love uh, everything else that we've got available to us to help us appreciate why we do what we do. That was Josh Casada, apparently a human who has held some of the most exciting titles you can. Right. All right. So at this point, I'm already giddy at all of this wonderful conversation about arts and sciences. And then NASA's administrator, Jim Bridenstine, steps up to the mic. Sorry, I, I, I just want to weigh in on this as well, if that's all right, for just a second. Look, we have a history, um, not necessarily from the United States perspective, but we have we, there, there have been commercial astronauts that have launched before. You just look at a, Anusha Ansari or Dennis Tito or Richard Garriott. Like there, there is a precedence for this activity. In the United States, we've had experience launching members of Congress and senators. There is a way this can be done. But to the point, there's a couple of things. We need to make sure that there are people that want to go to space that are not NASA astronauts. That's why commercial crew is so important. We want to drive down the cost for the activities we need to do, which means we need industry. I like to talk about the industrialization of low Earth orbit. Industrialization is what we need to do, but you're talking about poets. When you say poets, what I hear is pop culture. We need spaceflight to be embedded in every part of the American culture. 
because that's how we keep moving forward. That's how we encourage people um, and our members of Congress to continue investing in this activity. Um, but I'm also a big fan. Is it Mary Liz? Is that your name? That's right. I'm also a big fan of sending journalists. So maybe there's an opportunity for you. Yeah. I'm small. I don't weigh very much. <laughs> NASA Administrator Jim Bridenstine. If you are listening to this message, this is Mary Liz. I'm here to remind you about your promise <laughs> to send me to space. She's small. She doesn't weigh very much. I, just, I can fit in any strange compartment. <laughs> She's good at experiments. <laughs> I'm highly entertaining. <laughs> Please. In all seriousness... I've always had a dream of going to space and felt like I could visualize it for a long time, but I never truly thought that it would happen until now. All the people I interviewed for this episode have said, well, of course you're going to go to space if you really want to. The opportunities are opening up and we're going to discuss some of those in just a bit. Okay, so the landscape has completely changed. NASA and its astronauts are welcoming the idea of private space travel, even on their own missions, where they may have extra seats available. Let's circle back a little bit and talk about some of the private space companies who have dedicated a large part of their mission to space tourism. Jeff Bezos, founder of Amazon.com, has been putting more than $1 billion per year of his own money into his launch company, Blue Origin. So Jeff wants to build what he calls a road to space, the infrastructure that will make possible our wildest dreams about living in space. And he's building that road with a step-by-step -step approach, starting with his New Shepard suborbital rocket, scaling up to New Glenn. New Shepard is a suborbital vehicle designed for space tourism. New Shepard is powered by liquid hydrogen. It is the highest performing rocket fuel but it's also the most difficult to work with. And it's not needed for a suborbital mission. So why did we choose it? Because we knew we were gonna need it for the next stage and we wanted to get practice with that hardest to use but highest performing propellant. Same thing with vertical landing. Why did we choose vertical landing for New Shepard? It's very counterintuitive actually. There are other landing mechanisms that would have worked at this scale. In fact, vertical landing gets easier the bigger the vehicle. So the great thing about vertical landing is it scales up really well. The bigger the vehicle, the easier it is. And right from the start, we wanted to build a human-rated system so that we would be forced to think clearly about safety, reliability, escape systems, all the things that we knew we would need to have practice with in order to build our next generation of vehicle. I can't wait to start sending humans up in New Shepard later this year. It's a big deal. Let's talk about New Glenn. New Glenn is New Shepard's big brother. New Glenn is big enough that New Shepard will fit in the payload bay of New Glenn. It's 3.9 million pounds of thrust. It's a very large vehicle. So Blue Origin seems to be flying way under the radar. They are making massive progress out here on the Space Coast. Every morning when we go out on the beach, we can just look over the horizon and we see a forest of cranes building their launch pad. The scale of the facilities they're building here and the workforce they've created is just immense. It's bringing new life to the Space Coast. They're making such quick progress. Mm -hmm. Virgin Galactic is another company focused on suborbital space tourism. In fact, Richard Branson just announced that he's planning to take a private citizen to space this year. Last year at IAC, the International Astronautical Congress, George Whitesides, the CEO of Virgin Galactic, had a lot of exciting information to share. He discussed their progress, unveiled their new spacesuits, and told us why this mission is so important to him. So we rushed into the auditorium, grabbed our phone, and started recording audio. <laughs> Our purpose is to open space for the benefit of Earth. And it's a really exciting time for the company. You know, I think over the coming years, we're going to see hundreds and eventually thousands of people flying into space. And that's going to be a profound shift for humanity. We're going to go from a time when, you know, not many people know an astronaut, although everybody in this room knows an astronaut, but when, when most people don't know an astronaut, to a time when most people do know somebody who's, who's been to space. And I think that, that shift, that perspective shift, 
of people going into space will have a profound impact on humanity. I'm thrilled to hear so many organizations are outwardly dedicating their missions to this perspective-shifting human spaceflight experience. It's a profoundly different time, it feels. Mm -hmm. When we spoke with Novus Bivac last year, he informed us of an organization that is solely focused on gifting this experience to as many people as possible. You know, uh, Space for Humanity, uh, do you know about that? Um, tell it. So tell Space me more. For Humanity is a nonprofit that um, I also help support, um, but Frank White is very involved in that. What they're doing is they are going to take people from all walks of life, maybe even you, um, and and pay for them to go into suborbital flight. I'm I'm raising my hand yep, right now. You should um, because they want people to go and document the experience for everybody else, and they want it, they want to make it available to everybody. And so Space for Humanity. You know, it's going to be a way to take all kinds of people from all walks of life and, and get them to have the overview effect. Uh, so it's like a scholarship program. So Nova just shared with you an organization called Space for Humanity. Yes. And tell us a little bit more about this scholarship program. This is such an amazing program. Essentially, anyone anywhere in the world can apply for a scholarship to go to space and have this perspective shifting experience with the stipulation that they come back and they are committed to sharing the value of their experience with their communities. Right, there's a there's a social component to a social aspect, yeah. Absolutely, you have to be willing to share this with others. They're going to mentor you and help you integrate your experience mm. and bring that value to your community. Did you apply? You know I applied, you goofball. <laughs> Of course I applied. I'm Mary Liz Bender, and I'm so excited to finally submit my application to be a citizen astronaut and a social impact ambassador for Space for Humanity. The application process was a very thoughtful experience. Mm -hmm. I found it valuable. Even if I don't get chosen, I found it valuable for myself. I would encourage all of you to go through their application process once it reopens and just consider what it would mean to you to go to space, to see the earth from outside. And then when you come back, how might that influence the work that you're doing today? I'm really grateful that Rachel Lyons, the executive director of Space for Humanity, took time to talk to me about the application process and their mission. My name is Rachel Lyons. I am the executive director of Space for Humanity. And Space for Humanity's mission is to sponsor people from all over the world to go to space so they can experience our planet from space, which is one of the most transformative experiences, if not the most transformative experience that a human being can have. And then come back down and share that experience with our communities. So in all of that, we are working to expand access to space and really create that future that humanity goes into the cosmos while using that to benefit life on Earth. We envision a world where we embrace a culture of interconnectedness as we venture into the stars. We want to give people access to the overview effect because of that feeling of interconnectedness that all of the astronauts talk about. So we reopened our applications in July closed them in November, and in that time frame, we brought in about 3,700 applications from more than 100 countries, which there's been about 42 countries and nations represented in human spaceflight so far, so that already more than doubles that potential pool. So we'll select a crew of six to eight people. They take part in a leadership training program because we really believe that this is a vital experience for the future leaders on our planet. They need to have this planetary perspective in order to effectively make a difference in their communities. That type of leadership can look all different ways. You know, they don't need to be political leaders. They definitely can be, but they could also be like grassroots leaders in their communities. They can be like teachers. They can be public speakers. They can be singers, artists, whatever. So we'll be training them, strengthening each of their leadership skills, giving them skills that they can then bring to their current passions and the current things that they're working on. And then they go to space, they have that over effect experience, they come back down and they forward what, what they're passionate about. We are training the leaders of tomorrow mm. because that is, that is what our mission is. It's like people who are passionate 
who are carrying out what they care about and who can use this experience to strengthen those efforts. Isn't it beautiful that people with the means to make this happen are paving the way for citizens all over the world, regardless of their background, to go to space for the purpose of having this overview effect experience? Mm -hmm. It's really inspiring. It is inspiring. I mean, this is the reason that we started Cosmic Perspective together. Ryan and I are doing the work that we're doing because we want to gift this perspective to the world, not by sending people to space, but by bringing this perspective down to earth in all the ways that we can. Right, and connecting the groups that are doing it in different ways and elevating their messages as well. Mm -hmm. So we talked to John Spencer quite a bit in this episode, the founder of the Space Tourism Society. I was so excited to hear that this was also the main reason that drove him to found that organization. I realized that space tourism, private citizens going to space, not just professional astronauts, but private citizens going to space, would really be the breakthrough in terms of larger numbers of people having this unique life-changing activity and experience. I started the Space Tourism Society in 1996, and next year we'll celebrate our 25th anniversary. And we're pretty much the leading space tourism advocacy group Uh, in the world and have had numerous events and meetings and seminars and conferences and award shows and studies and really brought people from a very diverse background, whether it's entertainment industry or designers or the financial community or engineers or scientists, media people, a whole wide range of people with interest in space to kind of unite that interest around a center focus, which is getting the maximum number of people to have that space experience and to build a space tourism industry that's viable, sustainable, growable, and fun. One of my favorite quotes is that the uh, best way to predict the future is to invent it. And that was Mm -hmm. by a computer pioneer, Alan Keyes. So play, creativity, that's just where the breakthroughs, conceptual breakthroughs come through. And I call it exploring the design frontier. This episode is full of dreamers, Mm -hmm. many of which were inspired by artists in their childhood, sci-fi authors, for example. They took those dreams, and later in life, they built teams of hardworking people to turn the dreams into reality. Companies like SpaceX and Blue Origin, Virgin Galactic, and others. And now we have these organizations, these, these connected organizations like Space for Humanity, Space Adventures, Axiom, that work to connect those companies to all of us, which means more people can fly to space and have this experience. More artists can have this experience. They can come back and translate this in new ways, connect with new people, create new inspiring visions for the future, new dreamers, and the cycle continues. This is what gets us excited about the future. The idea that we have the capability to dream up the future that we want to see. And then we all work together to engineer and build that dream to make it reality. And as we're seeing just in this episode alone, it's clear that that is what humans do. And I want to see that going forward. I want to dream bigger dreams. No matter what's happening, in our lives, we have to maintain the dream and we have to maintain our childlike sense of wonder. We'd like to close this episode with a really beautiful audio experience from Virgin Galactic. The voice you'll hear is that of the founder, Richard Branson. It's a message to his grandkids about life and about space exploration. Thank you for listening. Thanks, everyone. A letter to my grandchildren. My dad, your great-granddad, was an extraordinary man, full of wise words. He would often remind me that life is wonderful, and it is that simple truth which has driven me as I built businesses, raised my family, and embarked upon my many adventures. You are at the very start of life. It is an incredible gift, 
and it is there for the taking. It will deliver highs and lows, but by living it to the full, by always trying to do the right thing, and by keeping a childlike sense of adventure, it will indeed be wonderful. I used to think of space as a destination, but I now realize it's a journey with some amazing milestones along the way. Your lives will be transformed by space and it will give your generation the planetary perspective on which the future of humanity rests. That we're all in this together, fellow travelers on Spaceship Earth. Today we pass the most significant of them all, is our beautiful VSS Unity, along with the hopes and dreams of so many, became the first spaceship built for regular passenger service to put humans into space. Virgin Galactic has shown that when you set off on challenging but important adventures, exceptional people come forward to join the journey. People who are consistently by your side and on your side. People who share your dreams and people who help make them reality. Rolling to the right. As I watch Unity and her brave pilot soar upwards into space today, my vision blurred by tears, I could hear your great granddad whisper once again in my ear, life is indeed wonderful. <laughs> 